Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. In Lessons from Lockdown, we're focusing on topics that are relevant to the current pandemic and the lockdown that we've experienced as a result of it. Last week, you heard Pastor Simon talk about Hagar, a biblical character described in the Old Testament who wrestled with isolation. That's something that's affected so many people during our current lockdown. But what I want to look at today is how this lockdown has highlighted to me that many of us place our identity in our success, in how hard we work, and how much we achieve because during this time of lockdowns and restrictions we've all had to deal with changes to our work and in a lot of cases settle for achieving less of our personal goals and personally i've found that hard to deal with because i love getting things done i love that feeling of having achieved something that i've been working hard towards in fact i have a to-do list on my phone and i just love ticking the box next to each item and watching it get crossed off as it's completed but it's not even just about getting things done. It's about doing them well. And I'm probably a bit of a perfectionist to the point where I agonize over small details that aren't even important. Even when it's small things like parking the car, I get this unusual amount of satisfaction from doing a perfect parallel park to the more important things like my day job, where I get a lot of satisfaction out of a good performance review. I do like working hard and I like seeing my goals realized because of my hard work and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. But then COVID hit and I found I wasn't getting things done. Working from home meant that I didn't have access to all of the resources I normally would in the office. I found that I was experiencing a lot of IT issues that wouldn't normally be such a big problem. All travel was cancelled. And I found that the people that I was relying on for input, they also all of a sudden had a lot of other commitments to take care of. And the result was that milestones were missed, projects were delayed. In fact, there are projects that were supposed to have been completed last year that are still dragging on today because of all the unforeseen consequences of being in lockdown. And when it came to do my performance review, I had to sit down with my manager and go through all the things that I was supposed to have delivered but had failed to. And to be completely honest, I felt like a bit of a failure myself, even though so many things were outside of my control and even having my manager acknowledge those things, I couldn't help but feel like if I just strived a bit harder, things could have still worked out. And that because things hadn't worked out like I'd planned, that my value was somehow diminished by it. My lack of achievement, my lack of success had made me feel like less. And I know I'm not the only one who feels this way. COVID-19 has disrupted our work. And I've seen two extremes. On one hand, where it's left many of us without any work at all, often feeling undervalued and isolated, stuck at home. And on the other hand, other people are experiencing massively increased workloads, either because they work in a key area that's now in high demand, or they are a young family juggling their work lives with homeschooling their kids. And this, the result of this in both cases is that deadlines get missed. Personal goals get put on hold. Achievements become harder to come by. And this has highlighted for me that perhaps many of us, myself included, have a dysfunctional relationship with achievement, where our personal worth and value is placed largely in the amount of work that we do and how many things that we achieve, our level of success in life, and then when those things are taken away from us, like in the current lockdown, it causes a great deal of tension and stress in us because the source of our value has been diminished or removed. And it begs the question, how much of our personal identity do we place in our success? And this idea that people can place their identity in their success might not come as a surprise to you given the world that we live in. We live in a world that worships success, whether it's in how much we earn, the desirability of the location we live in, the number of followers we have on social media, what accolades we've accumulated, where we went to school, all of these things, they're measures of success that people, I think, really do revere and adore having. And when people worship success, they commit to working towards those measures of success in all areas of their life. They work relentlessly on everything. They work on themselves. They work hard at their jobs. And while those things in themselves might not be bad, what is, is when those things become a measure of your own worth and the worth of others. That's the kind of 
power that success has in our world. It has the power to set people apart and to make us believe that some are more valuable than others because of what they have achieved. Success can lead us, I think, to ascribe greater value to certain people where a CEO is seen as being more valuable than a fast food delivery driver or a Nobel Prize winner is seen as being more valuable than a childcare worker. It's value that's reflected in how much we earn or in the social recognition of our achievements. And this worldview promotes one big idea. It says that you can achieve anything, you just have to work hard enough. Take, for example, Tim Gurner, a 35-year-old millionaire and real estate magnate. In 2017, he was interviewed by the program 60 Minutes and he said this. He said, when I had my first business, when I was 19, I was in the gym at 6 a.m. in the morning and I finished at 10.30 at night and I did it seven days a week. And I did it until I could afford my first home. There was no discussions around, could I go out for breakfast? Could I go out for dinner or whatever it was? I just worked. And if you watch the interview, Gurner seems very proud of his disciplined work ethic and he has worked hard. He's sacrificed a lot and he has become extremely rich because of it. By the world's definition, he is successful. But when asked about the issue of housing affordability in Australia and whether it was likely young people might never own a home, Gurner responded, absolutely, when you're spending $40 a day on smashed avocados and coffees and not working, of course. I know what you're all thinking, uh, the smashed avocado, bane of existence for all aspiring homeowners. But with this comment, Gurner effectively divides the world into two types of people. He says there are those who have worked hard and are successful, like himself, and those who are lazy and are unsuccessful, like those eating smashed avocado. He has placed his identity in his success and he's weighed others as being worthy or unworthy based on their relative success too. And he really embraces this worldview that says that you can achieve anything you want, you just have to work hard enough. Another example comes from billionaire Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter and Square, who in an article written for CNBC described part of what he believes has made him so successful and given him the ability to run two companies. He says that each day he wakes up at 5 a.m., he has an ice bath to help him wake up, he does two hours of meditation, walks eight kilometres to work, rain, hail or shine, eats only one meal per weekday before fasting or weekend. And to most people, this would sound like a gruelling routine. It's one not just of discipline, but of sacrifice. And his reason for keeping to this routine, he explains by saying this, I feel like if I could will myself to do that thing that seems so small, but hurts so much, I can do nearly anything. His belief that is that if he just works hard enough, he can do anything. And what these two examples show us is, I think, a real adoration and a reverence for success, so much so that they are willing to sacrifice for it. Success has become so important to them that they have optimised themselves for peak performance in everything. And to me, that means that success has become their religion. They not only worship it, they not only adore it, but they sacrifice for it. And there are lots of other everyday examples of worshipping success from how we take pride in always being busy to how we compare ATAR scores long after leaving school to our willingness to take out loans for properties that we can barely afford. There are so many measures of success that we really revere and adore having that in many cases we are desperate to have. But this worldview has a major downside. Justine Toe is a senior fellow at the Centre for Public Christianity, and she's written a book on this topic which she called Achievement Addiction. And it's in this book that she notes that we live in a culture where people's identity is tied to their work and their success and makes the really good point that if you define people by their achievements, if their identity is in their success, then we shouldn't be surprised to see them strive endlessly for it. She says this, when your identity is at one with your work, any failure to achieve can be soul destroying because your reason for existence has judged you and found you wanting. 
She argues that not only does this set you up to feel permanently insecure, but it provides no solid basis for identity that can withstand the shocks of life, a change of circumstances, losing your job, unexpected illness, or even simply retirement. She goes on to say, the biggest challenge facing those that worship success is that in the end, it's their responsibility to prove their worth and effectively save themselves. She says that your fate is ultimately in your hands, which makes success pretty sweet if you're successful. But if you fail, it's hard not to come to a logical and punishing conclusion that you just didn't have what it takes to thrive. And this is no doubt a position that many of us can relate to in the current pandemic, where many of us have had major disruptions to our work, where we've had to put personal goals on hold, where we've had to settle for achieving less, we've been left wanting. We've been left feeling insecure because our identity is so heavily tied to our achievement and our success. But in contrast to this worldview, where success is worshipped and people work tirelessly to prove their worth, comes Jesus. And there's a story he told that completely overturns everything our world says about where our value comes from. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells a parable about workers in a vineyard to illustrate how God's view of people's worth is so different to ours. In Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, I'm going to read the parable of the workers in the vineyard. It says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers from his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard, planting, maintaining, and harvesting vineyards in first century Israel was strenuous work and would have required hard physical labor in the heat of summer. So the people Jesus is telling the story to, that it wouldn't have been that unusual for a landowner to go out and seek additional laborers to get all the work done. And the landowner offers a wage of one denarius, which is what a Roman soldier would have been paid for a day's work. And that would have been considered very generous. And the workers here, you can see, they've accepted it without complaint. He goes on to say this in verse 3. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. And as the day has progressed, more workers are hired, we see. The specific wage is not mentioned, but the landowner, landowner promises to pay them whatever is right. And altogether, we see four groups of workers are hired, and the last group just one hour before the end of the day. And so it goes on to say this in verse 8. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. And as I read this, I have to agree with the workers who were hired first. It seems like a completely reasonable complaint. Those who have worked harder, suffered longer, and strived for their success should be recognised for it. But then the owner of the vineyard replies, in verse 13, it says this, that he, that is the owner of the vineyard, answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. And to be completely honest, the conclusion of that story seems a little unfair. I know for me, as someone who relishes in their achievements, 
I, I feel a little bit outraged on behalf of those workers. I know how they feel and I know why they are so disgruntled. They want to be recognised for their hard work. They want a reward that is consistent with their efforts, something that will set them apart. But in this story, Jesus overturns all of our preconceived ideas. And the first point to note about this story is that the owner of the vineyard represents God. And the owner is the one who actively goes out seeking workers. Up until that point, the workers don't have anything to do. It says that they're standing in the marketplace doing nothing. But the landowner hires them, provides them with the vineyard to work in, and pays them. Everything these workers have comes from the owner of the vineyard. And the point of this is to remind us that everything comes from God. God has provided us with the world that we live in. He's given us a purpose, and he is the source of our meaning. And that is really the starting point for understanding this parable. Some of the workers, they believe that they are owed something more based on how much they have worked, how much they have achieved. But that point of view misses something critical. It misses the fact that ultimately everything in life is a gift that no one did anything to deserve. So if we have achieved something for ourselves, surely that pales in comparison to everything we've already received from God. And that understanding should give us pause before taking pride in our individual achievements. Instead, our response should be gratitude, knowing that what we have been given is far greater than anything we could possibly have achieved on our own. And next we see that all the workers are given the same pay regardless of how long they have worked. And more than that, the usual ways that we tend to recognise people's contributions, like a high pay or a good performance review, they don't even rate a mention in Jesus' story. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't value hard work or that he thinks it's unimportant. I, I truly believe that God honours our hard work and he does value us putting in the extra effort when it's needed. But what Jesus is saying, though, is that in contrast to the way that we compare ourselves to each other based on our hard work, in God's kingdom, everyone has inherent value. And in the story, each worker is treated with this radical equality, leaving no basis for anyone to feel better than anyone else. It's saying in God's kingdom, your success or lack thereof doesn't determine your worth. God does. And so if everything comes from God, and everyone is valuable in God's eyes, then it stands to reason that the coin the workers are paid with isn't actually a wage, but a gift. They didn't really earn it. They received it freely and generously as a gift. And in that sense, the coin represents God's grace. It represents how in Jesus we receive total forgiveness as a free gift. Our salvation isn't earned by our hard work. It doesn't have anything to do with how successful we are. It's given as a free gift from God and given equally to all. Eternal life, in other words, is a gift unlike any other. It's totally free and there's no catch, but there is a cost and it costs Jesus his life. And we receive this gift through repentance, that's turning away from the bad stuff in our lives, and faith, putting our trust in Jesus. And so this story also highlights that actually some things can't be earned. And this really confronts that idea that our world has that if you work hard enough, you can achieve anything because salvation is something everyone can receive in equal measure. It can't be earned no matter how hard you work for it. There is no amount of achievement or success that you can have in this world that will ever be able to earn you your own salvation. And so I see now that that outrage that I was feeling on behalf of the workers in the vineyard where they all got the same pay, it comes from a culture that worships success. It comes from a place where the focus is solely on ourselves and how hard we work. It's a culture that encourages us to see people as worthy or unworthy based on how successful they are. But Jesus' story it reminds us of 
what really matters in the end and what preceded all of our striving in the first place. Realizing that everything that we have is a gift from God should change our focus and give us a desire to give thanks for everything that we have. That should be our starting place, gratitude. And if you're struggling with feeling unworthy, feeling undervalued, then now is the time to lean into Jesus' words in this parable because the picture we get of workers in the vineyard is a picture of God's grace. And it says you are valuable. You are worthy of salvation even when you aren't achieving. And for that reason, God provides us with the only solid basis for identity that can withstand the shocks of life like the current pandemic we're in. And so in light of Jesus' story, this is a good time to ask yourself, what do you place your identity in? What do you place your personal worth and value in? Is it in your work and your success? Or is it in God, the unshakable foundation? Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just lift up all those people to you today, Lord, that are struggling with isolation, are struggling with the pandemic and the lockdown, with being removed from their work, being removed from their sense of identity and their success, Lord. I pray that in you, Lord, that they would find their new identity, that they would be reminded, Lord, that they are valuable in your eyes, that they are worthy even when they aren't achieving, Lord, that you think that they are so worthy, so loved, that you would come down, step down from heaven to be with us and give your life for us. I just thank you so much for that amazing gift, Lord, something that we can never earn, that you give us generously and freely, given to everyone who seeks you. Lord, I just thank you so much for that and for the reminder that ultimately everything comes from you, that ultimately, Lord, Everything that we have, everything that we've ever achieved, it has its basis in the things that you've given us. And, Lord, I pray that that really turns us to a new viewpoint, a viewpoint where we're filled with gratitude for what you have given to us. And I pray, Lord, that that removes from us any pride that we may have that makes us think that we're better than others because of the things that we have, things that we've succeeded in in life. We pray this, Lord. In your mighty name, amen.